you have your Bible, please open it with me to uh, the Old Testament book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 6, in a message I'm calling The Arrows of the Enemy. Now, Halloween is just a few short days away, and whatever your thoughts are on Halloween, I think one thing's pretty clear. Halloween's been used to make a lot of people think that the devil's just a fairy tale. You know, he's got a pitchfork in hand, he's got these pointy horns, he's like the tooth fairy or Santa Claus or some make-believe figure. Folks, do not believe that for a second. He's real. He's as real as this table right here. He's as real as the chair you're sitting on or the person next to you. And he's not someone that should be joked about or dismissed. He's a destructive force that's out to get you and out to get me, out to get all of us and destroy our lives. Now, one of the pictures that God gives us of Satan in the New Testament is of him uh, shooting fiery arrows at each of our lives. I I want us to read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. It says, Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. You see, the devil's shooting arrows at us. He's drawn a large target on each one of our lives, and he looks for areas of vulnerability. And he looks for where he can hit. And once he finds that weak spot, he just keeps firing again and again and again. And sometimes he hits us. Now, when we're hit by Satan, we don't normally recognize it because he goes to great lengths to go unnoticed in our lives. The Bible says that the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. But the Bible says that he looks nothing like a roaring lion that he doesn't look like anything like a person firing arrows, that he doesn't look like a person with a scary mask and a pitchfork because he's disguised as an angel of light. That he wants to blend in and go unnoticed. Well, today I want to point him out to you, or at least I want to point out some of his tactics. I want to point out what do his arrows actually look like? What are they made of so that we can better avoid being hit by them? You see, in Nehemiah chapter 6, Nehemiah had faced and was facing some very real and direct attacks from his enemies. And the ultimate enemy behind his enemies was Satan. Now, the book of Nehemiah is about a Jewish slave by the name of Nehemiah who lived in Persia, and God called him to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls that had been destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C. Now, it's important to know that God called him. So this idea of rebuilding the walls did not originate in the mind of Nehemiah, but in the heart of God. And whenever God's on the move, whenever God is telling his people to do something, the devil is working overtime to attack his servants. So when Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, he gathers the people together. He casts them this vision. He says, let's arise and build. And the people, they rally around their new leader, Nehemiah, and they start rebuilding the wall. In fact, Nehemiah said the people had a mind to work. But any time the people of God have a mind to work, the devil has a mind to wreck. And that's what the devil tried to do. He tried to wreck the the plan of God to destroy God's work on the wall. Now, at first, it was a couple guys by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah who came and they mocked the people. They said, Nehemiah... Look at your personnel. They're weak. They're a feeble bunch. If if a little fox crawls up on that wall, it's going to come tumbling down. But the people of God just kept on working. So he turned to discouragement. They're about halfway done with the wall at this point. And Judah looks at all the work that's remaining. He gets overwhelmed and discouraged by it. He says, look at all this rubbish and rubble. How can we possibly finish? Now to add to his discouragement, all the peoples around them had formed a coalition to attack and to kill them. (laughs) Talk about a hostile work environment. They had one, right? And it wasn't just verbal, it was physical. They had every reason to fear for their lives. And and so with one hand, they're holding a spear, and the uh, other hand, they're holding a trowel, building and battling as they were. So their enemies, they end up backing off, off a little bit and Now the people's greatest threat surfaced, division. The people, you see, were divided between the haves 
and the have-nots. The common people were living impoverished lives and they were take, being taken advantage of financially. And so in chapter 5, Nehemiah confronts the rich nobles and rulers and he sets them straight. And to their credit, they repent and the work continued. But as we'll see in chapter 6, the enemy behind all of their enemies had a few more tricks up his sleeve, a few more fiery darts and arrows to fire. Nehemiah, he writes in chapter 6, verse number 1, he says, Now it happened. When Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall, and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Odo. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Here's our first principle. Distraction is a dangerous arrow from the enemy. Nehemiah and the people were making great progress. The wall was completely built except for the gates had not yet been hung. And so Sanballat and Geshem, they send a note to Nehemiah. They say, let's, let's meet together in the, on the plains of Ono. Now, the plains of Ono were about 20 miles north of Jerusalem. And so it would have been thought of as a pretty safe place to have a meeting of that kind. But Nehemiah knew better. He knew they were out to distract him from finishing the wall and they meant him harm. See, he knew Nehemiah had more work to do. The gates had not yet been hung. So he says, I can't come down to meet you. I'm doing a great work. I'm doing what God's called me to do. I will not stop. Do you know that one of the enemy's greatest weapons against us is distraction? Sometimes we think that, you know, Satan's only out to, you know, try to get us to live in rebellion against God, to live in this open sin and rebellion against our Lord. And if he can do that, certainly he's going to do that. But I think more often than that, not. He settles very quickly for distraction. If he can get us distracted and focused on something other than what God wants us to be focused on, he succeeded. My dad used to say, he said, the good is often the enemy of the best. That's a statement of priority. The good's often the enemy of the best. You see, we only have so much time. It's, it's not much. So much energy, so much money, so many resources. How are we spending it? Are we wasting our time? Or are we investing our time? The last several months, I've been thinking very differently about my time left on earth. And this perspective has actually been exhilarating. Each day I've been making decisions, doing my very best throughout the day to make decisions based on the possibility this could be my last year on earth. Now, even that is a little presumptuous because I might not make it to next week. We just don't know. But I have been asking the Lord every day, Lord, I know this could be my last year. What do you want? me to do for you in your kingdom today. And that perspective has brought me incredible joy and purpose as I'm realizing I'm actually becoming a better father and husband and pastor because I don't want to waste any days. No days. Even when Kelsey and I recently got away on our 20th anniversary trip and we're laying around and we're relaxing, I didn't waste any days. Because I rested with purpose. I cherished my wife with purpose. Oh, how easy it is to get distracted. Parents, I'm learning that our phones can distract us from our kids. Did you know that? God used my wife to tell me that. <laughs> Wives can do that sometimes, right? Kelsey and I recently started putting our phones up when our kids are home because my phone blows up all evening long. And I have this compulsion to check that email, to respond to that text. And that might be a good thing, but that's not the best thing. Not when my kids are around. When my kids, when I'm with my kids, I want them to know I am with them fully. Pray for me because I'm preaching this a whole lot better than I'm living it, okay? 
It's so easy to get distracted. My work is the gospel work. It's pastoral work. It's easy to get distracted. But when I'm with my kids, they need to know they have all of dad. Did you know that churches can also get distracted? It happens to many. As a church, we are to be focused like a laser beam upon making Jesus Christ known, knowing him and making him known. That's our message, the gospel, Jesus and him crucified. Paul said, this one thing I know, I have one mission, I have one aim, I have one purpose, one drive, it is to make Jesus Christ known. There is not a week that goes by that someone does not bring Pastor Brian or I a new ministry idea, good ideas, good things, good ministries. But as good as they might be, it is my job to quickly process. Would this new ministry distract our church from the greatest work that God has called us to? And if it will distract us, I'm learning to say no. Here's the deal. The devil would love to get us distracted from what God has told us to focus on, and that is making disciples. That's the mission of the church, to make disciples of the nation for God's glory. Leaders got to be able to say, no, I'm doing a great work that God's called me to. I'm not coming down from the wall. Now, Nehemiah says, he actually, these guys sent the message for times. They were persistent. And he says, each time I answered in the same manner. We need to learn from Nehemiah because sometimes, sometimes we were so focused at first, but then over time, we let ourselves get distracted. We, we let ourselves get wore down and we lose our focus. If you're a parent, you know the temptation of wearing down and losing focus, don't you? Maybe your son or your daughter asks to spend the night at a friend's house, and you say, well, we have church tomorrow. But you don't actually say no, so you leave yourself vulnerable to be pressed, right? That's what kids do. They say, well, they say, well I really want to go. And you say, well, I don't really think it's the best idea. When they say, well, well, please, and they say, well, let me think about it. Pretty please? Right? They lay the pressure on. They're persistent four times, five times. They keep asking until you fold. Listen, when good things distract you from the priorities you've set in your life, learn a lesson from Nehemiah to say the word no. No. We're not going to let good, the good, become the enemy of the best within my fam- our family's life. Now, verse number five, Nehemiah says, then Sanballat, sent his servants to me as before, the fifth time, with an open letter in his hand. In it was written, it is reported among the nations, and Geshem says, that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you've also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there's a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, And let us consult together. Here's our principle. Slander is a dangerous arrow from the enemy. Sanballat sends a fifth letter, and this time it's an open or a a public letter for everyone to see. And he says, it's been reported among the nations that you're building a wall in order to rebel, that you're going to make yourself the king. See, they're they're questioning Nehemiah's motives. They're saying, those motives are selfish. And did you know that God's leaders, often their motives are questioned? I think that little line, it's been reported, sends chills and causes every leader in the room to kind of tense up because we've all been on the receiving end of some of those letters, haven't we? Everyone's upset about this or that. Everyone thinks that you're making a big mistake. Okay, well, who's everyone? Well, everyone. Well, give me some names. Well, me and my wife. At least me, right? (laughs) Listen, just because it's been reported doesn't make it true, right? I mean, it's been reported among the nations and Geshem. Well, maybe it was just Geshem 
that started the whole thing. It could be fake news. And did you know that the devil loves throwing out fake news about God's people? The enemies of God love slandering God's people with exaggerated reports. The early church in the first century was actually accused of being cannibals. Did you know that? They were accused and persecuted. Their lives were under threat because they were said to be cannibals because they observed the Lord's Supper, which symbolized the body and the blood of Jesus. Truth twisted. We all, if we follow Christ, we're going to be slandered for our beliefs and what we take a stand for. That's just how it's going to work. King Artaxerxes had elevated Nehemiah to the point that he's now the governor. And his enemies now exaggerate that promotion. Well, that's just one step closer, Nehemiah, to your ultimate goal of being king of Judah. But that wasn't true. It was slander. It was gossip. Now, gossip is when someone shares something about another person with the intent to hurt that person or hurt that person's reputation. Whenever you're talking bad about another person and you're not part of the problem and you're not part of the solution, that's gossip. Now, gossip can actually be true at times. It doesn't have to be a lie. But most of the time, it's a truth that's been exaggerated. It's a little bit true with a whole lot of falsehood. The New Testament commands us, do not gossip. Do not be busybodies. Now, in youth group growing up, we used to play this game that we called telephone. We would all get in the circle, and one person would come up with a statement, and they would... Uh, whisper it in the ear of the next person. And so the person would hear that, and they would whisper it to the next person, and then to the next person. It went all the way around the circle. And by the time it got to the last person, they would say what they heard. And the original statement had been completely distorted. It hardly resembled the original statement at all. That's what gossip does. Person hears it a little bit wrong and misrepresents it. They add a little juicy detail. They exaggerate the truth. They don't share the whole story. It gets distorted and it's destructive. Proverbs say that God hates those who sow discord, division among brothers. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good? for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Paul's saying, if what you're about to say doesn't, isn't going to build others up, don't say it. Your words need to impart grace. You don't really need to tear people down. Verse number seven, Sanballat and Geshem say, come, let us consult together. See, the walls were almost done at this point. So I kind of think this may be, you know, this is kind of political concession speech time. We've lost. You've built the wall. Let's all come together. Let's find some compromise. Let's work together. But Nehemiah wasn't interested in compromise. Now, sometimes compromise is, is a good thing. If you're trying to figure out where to go to dinner with your family, um, find a compromise. Let's, let, let's compromise on this. But when you're working on what God's told you to work on, Compromise should not be an option. I heard about a man who was out hunting for bear, and he wanted a bear because he wanted a new fur coat. And so finally he saw this bear, and uh, he took aim, and he's about to pull the trigger to fire on this bear. And the bear said, hold on. Let's talk this thing over. Surely we can find a compromise because all you want is a fur coat and all I want is a good meal. And so they came together to talk this over. And when it was over, the bear had a good meal and the man had on a fur coat. <laughs> Just think about that. You'll get that in a second. <clears throat> I kind of think that's what Sandball is doing here. Let's meet on the plains of Ono. Let's consult together. Let's find some compromise. Let's figure this whole thing out when all he really wanted to do was to bring harm to Nehemiah because he's an enemy of God. I love how Nehemiah responds. He says, what you're saying is not true. He just, he simply denies the, the slanderous accusation. He's short. He's to the point. He doesn't give some elaborate explanation. He just says, that's not true. You made that up. And then in verse number nine, Nehemiah tells us 
what they were actually trying to do. He says, for they, that's the enemies, all were trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. They were trying to scare Nehemiah and the people. Here's our principle. Fear is a dangerous arrow from the enemy. There's a reason that over and over in Scripture, God says, fear not. Fear not. Fear not. You see, fear strips a person of their faith. It's very difficult for a person to have faith and fear at simultaneously. Fear strips them of faith. Fear weakens a person. Nehemiah says, they're trying to scare us so that our hands are going to be weakened in the work. So we're going to weaken ourselves. Fear weakens a church. Did you know that? Fear weakens a pastor. Fear weakens God's people. Fear weakens the mission of God. Isaiah chapter 41, verse number 10, God says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's going to be there for us. So no matter what comes our way, if God's called us to something, don't let anyone intimidate you from that. God will be your strength as long as you trust him. He strengthens us by our faith. Verse number 10, Nehemiah says, Afterward, I came to the house of uh, Shemaiah, the son of uh, Deleah, the son of Mehetabal, who was a secret informer. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come, kill to, you, come to you to kill. And I said, should such a man as I flee, and who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and in sin, so that they might have a cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. And he prays, my God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works, and the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. Here's what's going on. Sanballat and Tobiah were setting a trap for Nehemiah. See, in the ancient world, temples or holy places, sanctuaries, were often a safe zone. So that if someone was after you, someone was trying to harm you or kill you, you could go into that sanctuary, that safe zone, and it would be off limits for them to get you. You'd be safe. However, you read your Old Testament. God never gives his temple as a safe place, a safe zone for the Jewish people. In fact, no one was allowed to enter into the, the temple except for the priests. Nehemiah wasn't a priest. He knew it. And so Sanballat and Tobiah, they hired this secret informer to act like a prophet of God. And this, this prophet of God tells Nehemiah that he's in immediate danger. The people are they're coming to kill you tonight. You've got to go into the temple in order to be safe. And Nehemiah says, I perceived that he was not from God. Now, my question is, how? How do you think Nehemiah perceived that this guy wasn't from God? Well, it's the same way we perceive it. When, when someone's saying something that doesn't align with Scripture, you know it's not from the Lord. Here's our principle. Deceit is a dangerous arrow from the enemy. You see, the devil's a liar. In fact, he's called the father of lies. And he's going to do everything in his power to twist God's truth, to make you uh, be able to, in your mind, justify doing wrong by ignoring God's truth. But Nehemiah wasn't fooled. He knew what God had commanded, that only the priests are to enter into certain parts within the temple. You know, we've got to know the truth. <laughs> we will never be able to see the arrows of deceit coming at us unless we know the truth. We simply won't. You've got to know the truth so well that you can spot a counterfeit a mile away. You see, a person that's look, looking for counterfeit bills, they don't study all the counterfeit bills out there because they're always popping up. There's new counterfeits. Instead, they study the real thing. 
And they become so familiar with the real thing that it's so easy to spot a fake. That's what we got to do. We got to study the real thing, God's word to us, so that we can spot a fake from a mile away. The Bible warns us there will be false teachers, and they're going to be disguised as angels of light. Now, the Bible also says that we are not to believe every spirit, but we are to test the spirits to see whether or not they're from God. And here's the best way to test the spirits. I think the, the, obviously the Holy Spirit's involved in that, but it's knowing the Holy Spirit's word. It's knowing the word of God. I love what I heard Adrian Rogers say one time. He said, there's a little bell in me that tingles when I'm hearing God's word, and there's something that jingles when I don't. <laughs> I think that little tingle or that jingle is the Holy Spirit helping us discern truth. Is this a sweet sound to the ear, or is this a clanging cymbal? Something's off with that. Be on guard for arrows of deceit. I skipped right over the end of verse number 9, which is actually my favorite part of the passage. I want to read it again. Nehemiah prays. He says, Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Nehemiah is under attack from all sides. It's the same play the devil still has. Take out the leader and the people might fall. So he's after the leader. So Nehemiah, he he has a direct salt coming from from the enemy, from all directions, and he plays right in the mix of of this assault. He says, oh God, please strengthen me. Please strengthen me. Here's our principle. The shield of faith blocks the arrows of the enemy. We read Ephesians 6, 16 earlier, but I want to read it again. It says, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. If you're doing something for the Lord, be on the lookout for arrows of various kinds. Various kinds. And when they're flying your way, be sure to be like Nehemiah and raise up your shield of faith by prayer. That's what he does. It's a, prayer is, is faith. It's expressing faith. Lord, protect me. Lord, strengthen me. Lord, help me. Verse number 15, he says, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. They started sometime in August, and they finished sometime in October. Now, how in the world do they build this wall so fast? I mean, it's two and a half miles long. Well, for one, they just wouldn't quit. When they were made fun of, they just kept working. When they got tired, they kept working. When they were threatened, they took steps to protect themselves, and then they kept working. When they were divided, they were confronted, they confronted sin, they repented, they confessed, and then they kept working. Whenever they faced distraction and fear and slander, they just kept working. That's how they did it, humanly speaking. I want you to read with me how they actually did it. Verse 16, and it happened when all their enemies heard it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. Don't you love that? The only conclusion that the nations around could possibly come up with, God must have done that. That work was done by their God. You know, that's, that's the kind of life I want to live. People look at my life and say, oh, God must have done that. That's not normal. God must have done that. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. God, God must have done that. They, people look at the, the people of Valley Baptist Church and they see that the sum is far greater than our parts. That it can't be explained by by budgets and programs or anything else, but it was the work of God upon that church. That's what I want to be a part of. Now, we've run out of time to look in detail at chapter 7, but as you read it on your own, I want to encourage you to do so. You're going to read this long list of names that Nehemiah had found. It was a census of the people who were the first Jewish slaves to return back to Jerusalem from Babylon. They were in exile, and now they've returned back. 
They came, you can read about it in the book of Ezra. They came back under the leadership of Zerubbabel and then Ezra. And they came back originally not to rebuild the walls. That was Nehemiah. They came back to rebuild the temple. You see, the work of the temple and the work of the walls was primarily done not by the leaders, but by the people. I think that's the point. You you know, everything in God's Word matters. So this long list of names and you get overwhelmed by it, it matters. The point is that we, we all matter. It's not just about Nehemiah. It's not just about Jerubal or Ezra. It's the people of God, people of great faith, people of great sacrifice, people of great generosity. You see, the people who first returned didn't just work on the temple. They gave sacrificially to the temple. We read about that after the long list of names in Nehemiah chapter 7, verse number 70. It says, And some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the work. The governor gave to the treasury 1,000 gold drachmas, 50 basins, and 530 priestly garments. Some of the heads of the father's houses gave to the treasury of the work 20,000 gold drachmas and 2,200 silver minus. And that which the rest of the people gave was 20,000 gold drachmas, 2,000 silver minus, and 67 priestly garments. The people were all in. They worked, and they gave sacrificially. Now, next time we gather together to study Nehemiah, it won't be next Sunday. Lord willing, next Sunday, we're going to interrupt our series to look at a message about deacons within the church. Next Sunday night, we're ordaining 20 men to deacon ministry. And I want to bring a message about what is a deacon? What do they do? What's this all about? And then, Lord willing, the following week, a couple weeks from now, we'll be back in Nehemiah, and we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 8. And Nehemiah chapter 8, I think, is the greatest chapter in the whole book. Nehemiah is no longer building the walls. They've already been built. So Nehemiah shifts to the greater work, the harder work, building up the people. Did you know that's what Valley Baptist Church is all about? Building up people, helping them have a personal relationship with God, edifying them, discipling them, building them up. It's not about brick and mortar. It's about flesh and blood. It's about soul. So I want to wrap things up with a question. How's your soul? How's your soul? Is it tired? Is it broken? Has it been wounded? Is it lonely? How's your soul? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. Let's bow together in an attitude of prayer, if you will. Every head bowed, I close. This is a holy moment in the life of our church. In just a moment, I'm going to pray. And after I pray, we're going to stand and we're going to sing. And there's going to be pastors and other leaders here at the front. And we're going to ask you that if you don't know God personally, and you've never placed your faith in Jesus, turn from your sins and place your faith in him, we're going to ask you to do that right now. Why? Because you desperately need to. If you're broken, Jesus has a healing touch. If you're lonely, you're lonely because you were made for God to know him. And the only way to get to know him is through Jesus. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. If you're tired, Jesus will be your strength. I want to invite you to get to know him today. As soon as we pray and we stand to sing, uh, I want to invite you just to come down one of these aisles, one of these staircases, take one of these leaders by the hand and say, I, I, I want to give my life to Jesus. They'll know exactly how to help you. You don't have to clean up your life first. It's the opposite. You come as you are. 
in all the brokenness of your wounds and your scars, all of your failures, all of your sin, you come as you are. And Jesus will meet you where you are. He'll help. He'll be your strength. I also want to invite others to make a decision if perhaps you know the Lord Jesus by faith, but you've never been baptized like we saw earlier to go public with your faith if you haven't joined our church family and you'd like to do that. Or maybe say, I, I think God's calling me into full-time ministry to, to be a pastor or a missionary. Well, come, let us know. A, a call to ministry is a call to prepare. We want to help you get prepared for whatever ministry assignment the Lord has for you. However God leads, in just a moment, I invite you to come. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your good hand that was upon the people of Israel and your good hand that has been upon us. We don't deserve it, but we are grateful. Lord, I pray that if there's someone that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, that you would get to know them today that you would pursue them, that you would tug on their heart in such a way that they would place their faith in you. Help them, Lord. Give them the courage to come. Lord, reflecting upon the beginning of my message and the fact that we're sending out this huge team and Pastor Monty, Lord, to to help another local church. It just thrills my soul, Lord, that so many of these people have places of service, they're in life group, they've, they've been discipled here. And Lord, I'm so proud. In a, I'm proud, Lord, of the work that you've done through us. Lord, would you continue that work? Would you move in hearts today, we ask in Jesus' name, amen.